It's like an algorithm that you can rely on. It's a cognitive script, a mental shortcut that you can pull out whenever the situation is right. Even if you are talented, you can't succeed without having great habits. You don't need to lose weight. You need better eating habits, and then your weight will always be around where you want it to be. You don't need more money. You just need better financial habits, and then you'll always have enough money to manage the thing that comes up. You can be the architect of your habits rather than the victim of them. A lot of the time people talk about, you know, I want to have more money, or I want to lose weight, or I want some kind of result. But the truth is, your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Your knowledge is a lagging measure of your learning and reading habits. And so it's actually, we think the thing that needs to change is the bank account or the test score or the number on the scale, but actually the thing that needs to change are the habits that precede those outcomes. Every action you take is kind of like a vote for the type of person you want to become. And if you can master the right actions, if you can master the right habits, then you can start to cast votes for this new identity, this desired person that you want to be. Doing one push-up does not transform your body, but it does cast a vote for being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. The technical definition of a habit is a behavior that has been repeated enough times to be more or less automatic. So things that you can do pretty much without thinking about them. Uh, unplugging your toaster after each use, or tying your shoes, or um, brushing your teeth. Things that you pretty much just go on autopilot when you do them. Now, why does the brain build them? What, what role does it play? Well, as you go through life, uh, you need energy to survive. And this is true not just for humans, but for all organisms need some kind of energy to survive. And getting energy, uh, requires energy. You need to eat food to be able to walk around and find the next meal. Using energy is expensive because the more energy you use, the less you have available for the other things that life throws at you. And so your brain is looking for ways to conserve energy, to conserve energy whenever possible. And habits are a great method for doing that. So for example, uh, when our ancestors were roaming around the savanna, if there was a berry patch 100 meters from you, it made sense to go to that berry patch rather than one that was like on the other side of the mountain, right? You would choose the path of least resistance. And eventually, what your brain learns is, oh, whenever I'm by this tree, that means the berry patch is 100 meters away. And so the tree becomes a signal that, hey, food is over there. And your brain is always picking up on these signals throughout life that indicate where things are at. And the more that you come across those signals, the more you automate your response, and pretty soon you're taking a right when you get to that tree, even though you're not even thinking about it, you're just doing it automatically. Mm -hmm. And it makes that whole process of finding energy, solving the problems of life, and getting through things easier. It requires less energy and attention and effort than it did before. A lot of people don't feel like they have control over their habits. They feel like their habits are taking control of them, that they're like a victim of these bad routines. And once you start to dive in a little bit and like uncover the layers uh, and realize what a habit is and how it works, then you start to develop a little more control over it. If we're gonna be building habits anyway, then it makes more sense to be able to understand how they work and how to structure them so that uh, you can be the architect of your habits rather than the victim of them. And you break them down into this cue, craving, response, and reward, which is kind of not their traditional way. So. I choose that four-stage model, cue, craving, response, reward. There's a lot of science behind it. Uh, three of those four stages are very common, cue, response, and reward. And the idea, and there's you know 100 years of behavioral psychology research behind this, that if you show someone the right cue and they take an action and they, then you follow it with a reward, you can train them to do that thing whenever the cue arises again, whenever the stimulus happens. So, if whenever the light in the, the lab turns on, the monkey gets a squirt of uh, juice, then it knows whenever the light is on, I should go over and you know put my mouth underneath the nozzle to get some juice or whatever. And you can do that for all kinds of things. And it it's works for, for human behavior as well in many ways. But then there was the second wave of research with cognitive psychology over the last probably 50 to 75 years that shows that not only do external cues and external rewards influence our habits, but also internal moods, emotions, feelings, thoughts, beliefs, those influence our behaviors too. So you don't actually do something for the reward, you do it for the image that the reward creates in your mind. 
Uh, if you go to Amazon and you buy Atomic Habits or you buy some book or whatever, you aren't actually buying the book. You can't because you don't have it yet. What you're buying is the image that that sales page creates in your mind. You're buying the expectation that it will be a good book. Uh, and the reward of actually having the book or reading the thing uh, only comes afterward. It only comes after the action. I believe this is true for pretty much all human behaviors and actions. It is actually the anticipation that it will be good that gets you to lift it up. The reason that I take a drink of this tea is not because I like the tea. I can't, I haven't drank it yet. It's because I anticipate that having a sip will taste good. And so it's actually the anticipation or the hope, the prediction of what is to come that motivates all actions to occur. The craving motivates you to act, then you take the action, and then there's the reward, and the reward serves two purposes. And the first one is that it satisfies the craving that came before. So if the thing that got you to buy the online course or that got you to sign up for the personal trainer at the gym was the hope or the anticipation that, oh, if I do this, then I'll be getting fit, or if I do this, then I'll be you know, getting the ideas I need to build my business or whatever. Uh, you satisfied that craving by making the purchase. And so now that craving is actually gone. You, what you need is a different craving now. You need the craving to make sales calls or to do a set of burpees or whatever. Uh, that's the new craving that you need to actually stick with the, the real thing. Um, you fulfilled the craving that motivated the purchase. Uh, we mentioned the four stages, cue, craving, response, reward. And for each of the stages, I've come up with what I call a law of behavior change. So for the cue, the first law is to make it obvious. Uh, for the craving, the law is to make it attractive. Response, make it easy. And reward, make it satisfying. The, the first idea is you want to make the cues of your good habits obvious, available, visible, easy to see. The easier it is that they catch your attention, the more likely you'll fall into the habit. To, um, to break a bad habit, you just invert each of the four laws. So rather than making the cues of your bad habits obvious, you want to make them invisible. Rather than making it attractive, make it unattractive, make it difficult, make it unsatisfying. And an example, of, what is a good example of that for good and bad habits? So uh, one of the places I like to suggest starting is with what I call environment design. Um, so basically, the things that are on your desk at home, your kitchen counter, uh, your office at work, they influence your behaviors. Um, and if you can restructure your physical environment or your digital environment, then you're more likely to actually stick with uh, the right habit. As an example, a lot of people feel like they watch too much television. So walk into pretty much any living room, where do all the couches and chairs face? They all face the TV. It's like, what is this room designed to get you to do? And uh, now I'm not saying you have to restructure your entire house, but there are a range of choices you could make, right? You could take the chair and turn it away from the television and have it face a coffee table with a book on it. Or you could put the TV inside a wall unit or a cabinet, and that's something behind doors, so you're less likely to see it. But you can also use it to promote good habits. So, uh, for example, I used to buy apples, and I would put them in the crisper at the bottom of the fridge, and I wouldn't see them because they were tucked down there. And so then two weeks later, they would go bad, and I'd get annoyed because I'm throwing food out and throwing money away. And so I bought a big display bowl and I put it right in the middle of the counter and put the apples in there and now they're gone in like three days just because it's obvious. Uh, same thing was true when I built a flossing habit. I realized that for many years I would brush my teeth twice a day, but I would only floss every now and then. I was like, well, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because the floss was in a drawer in the bathroom and I just wouldn't see it. It was tucked away down there. So this time I bought a little bowl and put it right next to my toothbrush and put the floss in there. And now brush my teeth, put the toothbrush down, pick the floss up. Now I floss twice a day, which I've been told is excessive. So it's, you know, it's like uh, just the, all I needed was that uh, environment change and those habits were kind of able to, to fall in line. I heard a similar story with Google when they designed their workspaces, they put, um, they put the healthy drinks in front and then the non-healthy drinks like behind. Yep. So they don't try to restrict them from you because then everyone will be like, what the hell's going on? But mm -hmm. it's just easier to grab water and I think fruit and you have to like reach really far back to get like the sugar stuff. You don't need to lose weight. You need better eating habits and then your weight will always be around where you want it to be. You don't need more money. You just need better financial habits and then you'll always have enough money to manage the thing that comes up. And so um, it's really the habits that need to change, not the, the result.